calling for obedience to what we see in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 11, at the end of cha- the beginning of chapter 11, is absolutely impossible, humanly speaking. We read today in our uh, Sunday school class, the, the youth class, Psalm 10, 3 and 4, which describes what the unbeliever is doing. He's denying God. He's angry at God. He's greedy and lives to just get. He lives to get for self, for his own preferences and convenience, and he denies God and, and lives moment by moment as if there is no God. The believer, on the other hand, is awakened, is, is raised, is quickened, is made alive to the reality of God and the reality that we live for His glory. And that's the only, that's the only uh, appropriate pursuit for humanity. It's the highest and it's the only appropriate ultimate pursuit for humanity that we live for His glory. Paul has been uh, saying this in 1 Corinthians. He's talking to a church that has many problems, but they are a church. And he refers to them over and over as the called, those who are called in the, in the early part of this. And he talks about what that means and how the blessing of being called means that we have the Spirit of God. And it's, it's, it's amazing that I can even think that and be tempted to take that for granted and just say, well, sure. But that is beyond comprehension, really, that we... Though in our flesh we are unworthy and deserve only God's wrath and His justice, we are counted the righteousness of God in Christ and we have the Spirit of God. And because of that, it is right that there are commands in Scripture that point us to a higher plane for our living than all the rest of the world is pursuing. And what we're told to do is, even though you have certain rights, you ought not to just do them without thinking, but instead make your first priority love for God and others. And even if you have a right to do something, if it does not lead to the upbuilding, to the exaltation of God and to the upbuilding of God's people, then you ought not to do it. You should refrain. Now that is not worldly thinking, is it? That is not in today's society. If we've, if we've ever, if there has ever existed a society that says anything you can dream of that you think you might want to do, you do it, and don't you let anybody stop you. And Jesus, we we just sang that song. Uh, we're saved, and the the words used were at such a cost. What's the cost? The cost is the ultimate example of what we're looking at today. Jesus, who has the right every moment to demand absolute obedience, absolute adoration, to demand everything from everyone, yet came not to to be served, but to serve and to give His life is a ransom for many. That's the one we're following. We're alive spiritually because He has done this, and now we're being challenged to do it as well. The issue that has come up in 1 Corinthians 8, food offered to idols. The correct conclusion of knowledge is, not only does this food issue not mean anything ultimately, there's not even any such thing as idols ultimately. This is nothingness. The correct conclusion of knowledge is don't worry about it. It's not an issue. That's the correct conclusion of knowledge, and yet here is the instruction. If it causes your weaker brother who doesn't understand this yet to stumble, don't do it. Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols because your rights are secondary to the upbuilding of God's people. The building up of the body of Christ. Read Ephesians 4. I have a job because God wants His people built up. And so pastors, Christ gave that role, pastor-teacher. Pastor-teachers exist in a church 
for the upbuilding, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry so that we all together are in build, involved in the building up, the building up of the body. That is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. American Christianity, I don't know where else in the world, but American Christianity has flipped this and said, if you'll entertain me enough, if you'll meet whatever needs that I might have enough, if I can come, show up, leave, and leave feeling better, then I might, I might grace you, privilege you with my presence at your, at your church. And that's missing the whole point, isn't it? That sounds like idolatry. We need to understand we're not here for ourselves. Now, praise God, we are getting our needs met when we come for the right purpose, which is His glory. So we're talking about living life, a lifestyle that is according to the great commandment and the second one, which is like it, according to what Jesus said. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. This is a summary of the, the reason it says what it says uh, in all of the law and the prophets, and that's just the way of saying all of the, the books we call the Old Testament. Uh, the reason they say what they say is because you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. And for Christians, here's what it looks like. Let's, uh, let's look at what Paul says. He says in verse 13, on the issue of food sacrifice to idols, after he has declared there is nothing to this idol business, don't worry about it, but what you worry about is how your other believers are understanding what you're doing and what impact you're having on them. And so he concludes in verse 13 of chapter 8, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat food, meat lest I make my brother stumble. Now we're going to read uh, chapter 9, verses 1 to 18 as, as, uh, again. We did last week. We're going to pick up. We're going to finish the appeals that he makes because he uses himself in, as an example. He's going to say, I have a right to certain things. And in this case, he's going to say to your financial support. He's going to lay down the reasons that gospel ministers such as himself should expect from the church, that the church is obligated and he has a right to expect financial compensation for his work. And he makes several appeals throughout this. You're going to see several examples that he brings up and he's going to end uh, with this one. And, and finally, it's because the Lord commanded it. We're going to see that. And then we're going to see what he says he's done with those rights, why he has surrendered them at Corinth, for the sake of the gospel. And that's how we're supposed to do everything. It's not just, do you have a right to do it? What it is, is does this glorify God and build up others? That's the criteria, not, can I get away with it? Does it pass the test? Can I, do I have a right to do it? That's not the standard. The standard is, does it express love for God and others? 1 Corinthians 9, 1-18, Paul says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as to the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ." Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? 
In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I, do, if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, if I have a re- for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Lord, help us to understand the truth of your word. Now, there's two, two parts to this. The correct conclusion of knowledge and the appropriate application of love. That's what happened in the topic of food sacrifice to idols. He says, we all have knowledge. People assume, well, we all have knowledge. We all know that an idol is nothing. Uh, but, but Paul says in chapter 8, verse 7, however, not all possess this knowledge. That means there were some people... And one commentator put it this way. There were some believers in the Corinthian church, and and probably most of them had come out of pagan idolatry. That's what Corinth was known for. They'd never heard the gospel. Paul showed up, preached the gospel. A church was formed, a church made up of former idolaters. But some of them were further along in their understanding of others, and there were people in the church who, as one commentator put it, they had learned who was the right God, but they had not yet fully grasped that he's the only real God. And so it was very sensitive to them if they gave any appearance of having any association with anything related to idol worship. And the people who had the knowledge, they were saying, I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about that. That's nothing. That's, That's powerless. We serve the great, true, and living God of the Bible. And Paul said, you're right. And you're wrong to just trample over what other people are thinking and to lead them into participating in things that they thought, this, is, this isn't right. Romans 14, uh, the end of that chapter says, anything that does not proceed from faith is sin. So it, it's possible for one person to do something and it not be a sin and another person to do something and it be a sin. If you do something and you think it is a sin to do it, you are committing a sin. You are knowingly doing something that in your mind is wrong. So it's a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of technical rights. Now, do we want to teach people that God is the only real God? He's not just the only right God. He's the only real God. Of course we do. And that's here. But we have the correct conclusion of knowledge, but then we have the appropriate application of love, which means limiting our liberty What knowledge might teach us, we limit that for the sake of love for God and others. And Paul here is using his own ministry in Corinth as an example. He is saying, I have the right to your financial support. I have not taken it from you because it would hinder the gospel in his view. Now, he didn't refuse all uh, financial help, and we're going to see that in just a moment. Now, he makes several appeals uh, here. And by the way, this is very uh, appropriate for a church who has paid ministry. There are people out there who claim that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. Does that matter to us? Of course it does. We want to know. We want to do what's right. We want to do it God's way. Do we not? So we have a paid ministry and that me and uh, I'm supported full time to do the work of of preaching and teaching. And we also uh, support Pastor David uh, some financially. But you know what? We need to ask, is that, is that what God expects? Does He want that? Or is He displeased with that? I hope that matters to you. But the reason we're doing what we're doing is because of what the Bible says here and in many other places. This is a slam dunk argument when Paul is just saying, he wants them to see, I have the right to receive financial support from you. He makes an, an, an amazing case, an amazing case. He makes an appeal to salvation, to his own salvation and apostleship. He makes an appeal to the practice of fellow church leaders. He points, he names Peter, Cephas, the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord 
saying they're receiving financial support, not only for themselves, but also for their families. So do we not also have a right to take along a, a wife, a believing wife like them? Now, not all of them were married, but some of them clearly were. And, and have financial support, that's what he's saying. He makes an appeal to common sense, the way of the world in, uh, in working and wages. Working and wages. Some of you went to a location most every day this past week, and you spent hours there, and you did it not as a hobby. You did it to receive a paycheck. And you would not have gone there. It's, in fact, if they tell you, we're cutting the check off. You're not going there anymore. <laughs> this is common sense. That's what he appeals to. And we're going to pick up at his appeal to Scripture and the Torah, the law, in verse 8 today. We're going to look at his appeal to the support of the priests in the temple, his, and then finally his appeal to the command of the Lord Jesus. And like uh, many times you see in Paul, he, he, he lets his... Uh, uh, the other part come out before he's finished with the first part. So that's why in chapter 12, we've got, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle. We don't use this right. And then he adds two more reasons that he has the right. And then he gets back to, and we don't use this right. So it's a little overlap. Here are the rights I have, but I'm not going to use it. Oh yeah, a couple other reasons you need to know I have rights and I'm not going to take advantage of them. So that's what he's doing. So let's look uh, in verse eight there. He says, do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? You see there? There's his appeal to the Torah, the law, the Scripture. Gordon Fee has written a big commentary on 1 Corinthians. He wrote, Paul is seldom content with an argument based solely on just the way things are, so he supports his rights with an appeal to Scripture. It would be incomplete without an appeal to Scripture, right? But he, he does it here and... Uh, and in other places as well. He appeals to Scripture and he quotes Deuteronomy 25, 4. He, he quotes it here. It is written in, in verse 9, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. And see, now that goes back to his appeal to the common sense workers and wages. The plowman ought to plow knowing I'm, I'm going to benefit from the plowing. The thresher ought to thresh knowing I'm expecting to benefit from the threshing. People don't expect otherwise. We live in a society that really our whole economic system is based on this. But he doesn't just talk about that he points to a, a biblical principle here. He applies it to human workers. Now he says that God requires that they not muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. As it's trampling, uh, preparing, doing this, going through probably in a circle around, uh, around a, you know, a, a swivel. You've seen those things set up at like a mill. And they were not to prevent the ox from reaching down and getting a bite from time to time. That's what that means. Don't muzzle the ox. Now this does not deny that God is caring for the oxen. That's, this is not what Paul is doing. He's not saying um, that shouldn't be understood that God wants the oxen to get a bite. Of course it does. That's the surface level meaning and the first application of that instruction in Deuteronomy 25, 4. But Paul is applying the truth in a clearly more important way. He's taking a principle and applying it in a weightier to a weightier matter. Some interpreters throughout history uh, have abandoned the original literal meaning and context for an allegorical spiritual meaning. An example of those would be uh, in, among Jewish commentators, Philo uh, in Alexandria, and then also Augustine in among Gentile Christian commentators, Augustine was known for spiritualizing passages. Uh, sometime you should study um, the uh, Good Samaritan parable and see what all Augustine said the various elements stood for. 
Uh, this is not the way we need to read Scripture. We need to read Scripture saying, what did God mean when He wrote? And so that's why Paul would not ever say God had no concern for that oxen when He, when he gave this command. Of course He did. He's saying, but we ought to learn more than just God doesn't want the oxen treading out the grain to be prevented from getting some, some food from His labor. This is not what Paul is doing. He's not denying the original meaning. He's saying that the lesson to be learned can be applied in weightier ways. He is within traditional approaches to, approaches to interpreting the Torah by making this claim. God's care and provision for humans is a higher principle. Now, now we need to hear this in today's society. I think there was a time when I would have said, I can't envision a day when it would need to be taught clearly from the pulpit. Human welfare is more important than plant and animal welfare. Now, I know that there's interconnections there. I'm completely aware of that. But I'm just telling you that here's my view. If there's a fire and I can try to help you get out or try to save a bush, I'm going to try to help you get out. And I'm saying that I'm being biblically correct to do that. Okay? Now that doesn't mean we ought not to be good stewards of the resources we have. Of course we should. That's a different issue though than saying that human life is of more value. Now God knew that when He gave Deuteronomy 25.4. But if you need some more uh, confirmation... Jesus Himself confirmed that humans are more valuable than animals in Matthew 6.27. Matthew 6.27, in the Sermon on the Mount, J Mount, Jesus said, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? There's Jesus going on record. Humans are more valuable to God than birds. Okay? I hope that that's just common sense amongst us here. But if not, then repent and bring your thinking in line with what God's Word says. He also makes appeal to the support of the priests in the temple. So that he appeals to Scripture. He quotes Deuteronomy 25.4. And yes, in this quotation, as Paul applies it, the gospel minister is in the role of the ox. <laughs> Do not muzzle the ox. Paul is saying, I have a right to get a bite <laughs> every now and then. That's what he's saying, just like the ox does. Now he makes an appeal to the, to the support of priests in the temple, and this is also a, a scriptural appeal. This was true both in God's temple service as well as a reality for those serving idols in pagan temples, which context is the occasion for this very discussion, right? The reason that they're asking him about this what about when somebody buys an animal slaughters it some of the animal is used in a as a sacrifice to a to an idol that pagan priest gets some of it to take home and the, and maybe he sells it or maybe he takes it home, takes it home and then what's ever left over maybe the guy takes it home maybe he sells it in the market does it matter where that food in the market came from doesn't matter. That's the question. That's what Paul is saying. Even in God's design, those who worked at the temple were to be provided for through the offerings and sacrifices brought to the temple. You can look in uh, Le uh, Leviticus 6, 16 and 26. Leviticus 7, 6. Deuteronomy 18, 1. Numbers 5, 9 and 10. Or Numbers 18, 8 to 24. Numbers 18, 8 to 24 is a good passage to understand this teaching. But here's verse 21. To the Levites I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do their service in the tent of meeting. So he's saying I'm providing for the workers in the temple through what is brought to the temple by the people. Does everybody see that? The Levites were supported. And amongst the Levites, a smaller group, the priests, and they were supporting those other verses. You can study and find out exactly which portion of an animal was to go to them. Uh, they got food through the sacrifices, through some of them. So Paul appeals to that. 
And then finally, he appeals in verse 14 to the command of the Lord Jesus. In verse 14, he says, in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Uh, he probably has in mind Jesus teaching the laborer deserves his wages uh, from Luke 10, 7, and also recorded in Matthew 10, 10. And this was in the, the context of the sending out of the 12, or for the sending of the 72. The two different sendings. The idea, though, is God will provide what you need. You do not have to uh, self-fund. So that, that is taught there. Now let's see what else the Bible says about this. Galatians 6.6 6 says, One who has taught the Word must share all good things with the one who teaches. One who is taught the Word must share all good things with the one who teaches. And let me say, thank you for doing this. Thank you. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. And the word there for honor is a word that can be applied to finances. Especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And the word labor there means labor to the point of exhaustion. Now, this means those whose work is evident so that when they preach and teach, it's obvious I'm growing in my understanding of what God's Word says about topics as we come to them in Scripture because, look, somebody is laboring in preaching and teaching. Somebody is learning what does it say, what does it mean, and then proclaiming and applying that. That should be happening in all churches. That should be happening in every church labor in preaching and teaching. That is the number one thing that preachers, that pastors are called to do. Preach the Word, Paul said in 2 Timothy 4.2 from death row. Preach the Word. And then he quotes again in, in 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul, writing from death row, still believes it's right to apply Deuteronomy 25.4 to this situation because he quotes it again. For the Scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox uh, when it treads out the grain. And, he quotes, the laborer deserves his wages. Now this is interesting, this is a little aside. Paul considered Luke's gospel to be Scripture. Because he says, Scripture says, and without giving a citation, he says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. That is clearly a quotation of Deuteronomy 25.4. And he didn't cite Deuteronomy 20. He just said, here's what it says. Here's what Scripture says. And he says, Scripture also says the laborer deserves his wages. In all of Scripture, the only place those words are are in Luke 10, 7. So Paul quotes, well, Luke is quoting Jesus. Luke wrote it down. Paul quotes Luke's quotation of Jesus and calls it Scripture. That means Paul considered Luke's writing to be Scripture. That, that was an extra. Now let me show you why it is that I would tell you about offerings that go to help missionaries in Utah and Idaho and churches working there and why we take up an offering for people that we haven't even met we were taking the gospel around the world. 3 John, the third epistle of John, verses 5 to 8. Uh, I believe it was B.H. Carroll who called this the New Testament Law of Missions. Here's what it says. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they've gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Now this gives us some insight. John is saying you did well to receive these people who came through who are you did not personally know them. They're strangers to you, but you know they're preaching the gospel. You received them, gave them hospitality, and sent them on their way, and thereby you participated in their work. Now that's what Paul was doing in Corinth. He showed up. People hadn't heard the gospel. He showed up as a missionary, and the first thing he said was not, now listen, if, if you'll pay $5 to me, I'll let you come in, take a seat, and I'm going to tell you some really good stuff. That was not his first words out of his mouth. Would that have been an effective 
Probably not. So he says they're accepting nothing from the Gentiles, from the unbelievers, from the pagans. They just want the pagans' attention. They want the pagans to listen. But they've got to eat and they've got to sleep as they go. And so it is right and good and proper to support serious missionaries who we know what they're going to say when they get there and to send them. That's why I'm pleased to take up a love offering for Keaton Halley tonight uh, to help him get to the next place to encourage people to know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's why we're doing that. That because he's doing good work for the name, for the, uh, for the sake of God. So, so that's the right. You know, remember, Paul used the word I, me, and myself 52 times, the plural we or our 11 times in verses 1 to 18, or starting in 8.13 through 9.18. So 63 references to himself or he and Barnabas or others who were working as missionaries. And he uses the word right or rights or rightful claim seven times. Now one time it's not actually there, but he said we're not taking advantage of these things and he means his rights. And so he makes seven references to his rights. And that means that the correct conclusion of knowledge, when you read all that, I hope that you can see that the correct conclusion of knowledge is that gospel ministers, including Paul here, should be financially supported by the church. I mean, that's a lot of evidence that he marshals for that, right? He's made several appeals. And then he says this, we've not made use of this right. We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. So now we're going to see his appropriate application of love. It's an easy one. It's simple to see. The priority of the gospel over personal rights. It's found in verse 12. It's found in verses 15 to 18. We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. He surrenders his rights. 15a, I have made no use of any of these rights. 18b, we not, we, uh, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So I see, see what he's doing. I have this right. I have chosen to surrender it in your case for the sake of love for God and others, for the sake of the gospel. Paul put everything behind the importance of the clear proclamation of the gospel. And here's what you need to do. You need to put everything behind living for the glory of God and love for God and others. Everything. Well, I would serve God, but have an opportunity to pursue this very lucrative financial opportunity. That works okay for a little while. At the judgment seat of Christ, you are going to have nothing but regret for choosing money over God. For choosing, choosing convenience. For choosing safety. All of that. I'm just telling you, it's not that you'll be more likely to be convinced you will be utterly convinced at the judgment seat. All of the illusion will fade away and you will see Jesus is the only, only goal worth pursuing in human life. Don't be distracted by this other stuff. Even your own rights that are true don't need to stop you from putting service to God first. Now, he didn't name the specific reasons that his receiving financial pay from the Corinthians might hinder his gospel work, but it's clearly because he thought that for whatever reason, it would hinder his gospel work. Right? He, he, there's some reason that he was not going to take a cent from the Corinthians. Now, when you look at all of the terrible things going on in their church, I think just generally he wanted to keep a complete... He wanted to be free from any claim that they would have on him to say, now, Paul, you are getting into some things that we don't want to hear, and if you want to keep that check coming, you need to close your mouth. He did not want to have financial dependence on these Corinthians when it wasn't necessary. That seems to be it. Uh, Robertson and Plummer, a very helpful commentary on 1 Corinthians, they said St. Paul's passionate determination to keep himself independent, especially at Corinth, appears in various places. 2 Corinthians 11, 9 and 10, he's talking about the same stuff. 1 Thessalonians 2, 9. 2 Thessalonians 3, 8. So in Thessalonica, 
He also he went as a missionary, like we read in 3 John. He said, third, John wrote to this church that he was writing, the ones he was writing to, saying, you ought to support these people because they're going out accepting nothing from the Gentiles. That's what, poli- that's what policy Paul had in place. And that's the policy of most missionaries to show up not asking for support in exchange for telling them some good news that they've never heard. That's not the way to show up in a place the gospel's never been preached and say the first thing we need to do is work out the financial terms. That's not attractive. If somebody's told me, you know what, if you'll give me $100, I'll tell you something good. You know what I, I mean? Don't give them the $100. I mean, that's not, <laughs> don't do that. I wouldn't do that. Who would do that? I, I promise it's really good. <laughs> no. That's, you, you go preach the word and God's, God will provide the support through the people who ought to be uh, providing it. Now, Paul was saying, you should be providing it, but I have the right to not accept it. Going back to the quote from Robertson and Plummer, they write of Paul, he must be free to rebuke and his praise must be above the suspicion of being bought. While laboring at Corinth, he could accept help from Macedonians, but not from Corinthians. Now listen to 2 Corinthians 11, 7-12. This is an explanation. Now he's writing to the Corinthians. And believe it or not, some people said, this, this setup where you don't receive any money from us, we don't like this. So here's what he says. 2 Corinthians, which is almost certainly the fourth letter from Paul to the Corinthians, at least the fourth. I mean, they had a tro- he had trouble with the Corinthian church. There was lots of stuff going on. 2 Corinthians 11, 7 to 12. Did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And that's where Corinth is. And why? Why? Because I do not love you, God knows I do. And what I do, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. Now that's what Paul is talking about over here in 1 Corinthians 9, 15-18. Look at the last part of 15. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. Look at verse 18. What then is my reward? Then in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not make full use of my right in the gospel. What he's saying right here is I am going to continue. Remember what he said in 2 Corinthians? I will continue to do what I'm doing. Here's my policy in Corinth. I'm not taking a cent from you. I'm taking help from Macedonia but I'm not going to take it from you. And it's because I love you and I'm trying to minister to you that I'm doing this. And I'm not going to move away from my calling, which is to say I'm preaching the gospel no matter what. And apparently Paul believed that taking money from the Corinthian church would undermine his claim to be an apostle. And they would be tempted to think of him as a hireling or that the money had clouded the issue, and he was not going to let that happen. He didn't have that concern with the Macedonians, did he? Uh, Go back and read Philippians 4, 10 to 20, where he thanks them. Thank you for sending the support. And that was when he was in jail, not in Corinth. He, He thanked them and said, the best thing about this is not that it provides something for me, though I thank you for that, because I've learned to be content. I've learned the secret is to be content, uh, to to be uh, needing more or to have more than I need. I can be content in either of those situations. And he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, uh, which it turns out is not in the context of athletes can put that on their shoe and think that God will help them win the championship. It's in the context of Paul saying, I'm going to serve God whether I don't have enough finances right now, but I'm going to trust God anyway, or I have more than I need. 
And most people have probably been in both of those situations in life. Paul is saying, I've been in that situation too, and my circumstances do not affect my calling. I'm going to preach the gospel. And what is it to you if I have the right to not take your money and take the Macedonians' money? That has nothing to do with what I'm doing here. I'm preaching the gospel to you and calling you to obey. That's what he was saying. So he was claiming that his reward is, I am called to preach the gospel and I do it free of charge. I don't set any uh, financial requirements up before I preach the gospel. And that's how any gospel minister ought to be thinking. Any gospel minister that would say, I won't lift a finger to do anything in the gospel until I see a check. That, that's not, that's not going to make it. No, Paul is saying, I'll, I'll, <laughs> how strongly does he say it? I would rather die. He felt very strongly so strong that he would say, I'll, I'll rob other churches. In other words, I'll take from them. And I'm not even preaching there right now. I'm preaching here and to you. I'll take it from them, but I'm not taking it from you. Whatever had happened, a ministry decision had been reached. Accepting financial payment from the Corinthians will hinder Paul's ministry. Therefore, that's off the table. Now, can you imagine being so committed to what it is that you do all the time? You actually were to say that. Now's the time to consider what's worth doing whether you ever get paid for it or not. Serving God. Serving God. And that we're all on the same level here. Serving God is worth doing whether we ever get paid for it or not. I would be in sin to say, I won't be doing any preaching, teaching, mission work, won't be doing any of that unless I see a check. That'd be sinful. I do have the right to say, if I'm going to be the pastor teacher here, how, how, how am I going to keep myself and my family alive? That's a reasonable question. If the ox gets to get a bite every now and then, Paul says, surely an apostle, in his case, surely a pastor has the right to support. So we need to remember that a church does not have the right to say, what we're looking for is somebody who's going to labor to the point of exhaustion and preaching and teaching and you know, you know, get a job somewhere. It's not our responsibility. Now that may need to happen. There are churches where they need the Word, and, and I've, I've been there. I have not made a living in ministry and been involved in ministry and got my living from somewhere else. But the church ought to do everything as much as possible to say, we're going to pay our pastoral ministries, our ministers. We're going, if we have somebody from whom we expect labor to the point of exhaustion and preaching and teaching, then we're not going to ask them, now once you're exhausted from preaching and teaching, now you need to go to your place of work and make some money so you and your family can stay alive. That's what Paul is saying. But he's saying to the Corinthians, but you know what? Here's an example. You who think you have knowledge and you know that an idol is nothing and these simple uh, ignorant people need to learn my rights so that they'll know I'm not in sin by doing that. If, you're, if that's your attitude, look at what I'm doing. I'm an apostle, is what Paul said. And I'm foregoing my right to your financial support for the sake of the gospel. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. This is the appropriate application of love. The surrender of rights. A willingness to endure anything for the sake of the gospel. We read 2 Timothy uh, one. And well, we read 2 Timothy 2. Here's what 2 Timothy 1 says 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 12. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, 
but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, Christ, or Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immor immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I've believed and am convinced that he is able to guard that until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus." There's our application. Follow the pattern. Here's the pattern. I have rights, but I'm willing to surrender those rights for the sake of God and others, His people. That's the pattern. How far do you go? Paul says, I'd rather die than abandon this pattern. Paul says, I endure anything. I endure everything. In one case, for the sake of the gospel, and the other, for the sake of the elect. It's the same thing, though, for the sake of God's purpose in salvation. The fact that He is redeeming a people for His own possession, and nothing should have a priority over that in the Christian's life. We're not all called to the same role, and we'll get to that in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're not all called to labor in preaching and teaching. But we are all called to surrender ourselves, our bodies, as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable to God. And we cannot plead, well, I needed some money. That's, that's a bad, that doesn't, that's a bad trade-off. That's a bad investment. It's a bad investment. Jesus, Jesus thought it was a bad investment. Mark 8, 36, he said, Jesus said, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Now let's be honest. Most of us are not in the stakes that are that high. We have not been offered the whole world or Jesus, right? We don't have... I'm certain that none of you have ever had that option laid out in front of you, the at the UN, they call you into the UN or wherever it would be that this offer would be made. Jesus had it made to him. Satan himself came. I tell you what, I'll give you the whole world if you'll renounce Jesus and thereby lose your soul. What would it profit? None of us have had those stakes, but you know what? We have every moment the choice of am I going to live for Him or am I going to pursue my own preferences, comforts, convenience, and even rights? Do you see that? If it's true for Jesus to ask, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Couldn't we say, what would it profit you to prove your argument right? But to harm a fellow believer in the process. Would that be a profit? Not according to what we've been reading. It'd be better to forfeit your rights for the sake of love for God and others. Revelation 2, 10, the last part of that verse says, Jesus said, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. You say, how far do we take this? That's how far. How far do we take this? Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Jim Elliot was martyred as a missionary in Ecuador by the unreached Walrani people in 1956. Uh, he had a desire to take the gospel to these unreached people in the jungle in Ecuador and worked on it, made contact, and then he and some others landed on a sandbar in a river and uh, made some contact, but then things went wrong and the tribe attacked them and killed this band of missionaries included Jim Elliot. Here's what was found written in his journal. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain 
what he cannot lose. He's absolutely right about that. Our church will reach its potential. Obviously, for our church to reach its potential, what happens in the pulpit is of primary importance. We're either going to have the preaching of God's Word or not. Today, I believe, by the grace of God, we've had the preaching of God's Word calling for a kind of approach to life that is completely countercultural. That is easily dismissed as, this is not a big deal. As long as I've got my doctrine, the deity of Christ, justification by faith, creation God created, as long as I've got that, how, you know, how if I pursue my own rights and it hurts other people's feelings, it's not a big deal. No, it's a big deal. In the middle of 1 Corinthians are these Chapters 8, 9, and 10, and the first verse of 11. And you see what they're dealing with. They were dealing with sexual immorality in the church. They were dealing with factions in the church. And yet, Paul spent all of this letter, the core of the middle of the letter, trying to drive home, you need to limit your liberty with love for God and others. Do you know if we all live for God and for one another before self, that that's going to help our church reach our potential. I mean, I, we'll be a spiritual powerhouse. Did you know that the devil is powerless when that kind of Christian living is going on? He has nothing he can do. Jesus defeated him with this very attitude. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And he was so set on that mission that when the devil literally said, you see all this? And by the way, he's called the God of this age. In some sense, it wasn't out of line for him to offer this to Jesus. Now, he, he's only that because God allows it for a very limited time. But he, Jesus had this happen. If you'll do all of this, nobody will nail your hands and feet to a piece of wood and blame you for sin when you're the only sinless one. That was an attractive offer to the sinless one. Hey, you'll be treated like the sinless one instead of the scum of the universe. But Jesus stayed true to his mission. Will you? Will you who have benefited from Jesus' work, will you be willing to limit your liberty with love for God and others? If you've never put your faith in Jesus... An attempt to do this will not make you right with God. The first thing you have to do, surrender your life to God. Trust Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. If you need to know more about that, don't leave today. Uh, Come up for prayer after the the benediction. Uh, Go to the Welcome Center in the Fellowship Hall and say, I need to know more about following Jesus. And those of you who are already born again, who are already followers of Jesus, limit your liberty with love. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that you make it clear to us what you want us to do, how you want us to live. Help us. Help us to know the truth, that it doesn't profit us at all to gain the whole world, but to lose our souls. Help us to understand that principle and how it applies even for saved people, Lord. The investment should be in you and your kingdom and not the things that are temporal and passing away. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for grace. Thank you that you help us and that you've given us everything we need to live in obedience. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Walter, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine and preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria.